President Biden has just announced that he is ending his re-election bid. The series of events that we've seen leading up to the announcement, we cannot trivialize. The, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with... Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. He, he did not do well at all. Then you have the issue where some crazy guy planned an attack. And then you found Democrats actually pushed Joe Biden off the cliff. Now, Biden steps down in the recent announcement and nominates Kamala Harris. I, I actually, I struggle to recount any strong value systems or let me even say policies that Kamala represents. You know, I wish more, more respectable more dignified and true champions of women are fielded for power positions and political office political appointments like this but many times uh, the the choice of the women that are fielded for this kind of positions are the people who can't even define what womanhood is I think we have to put this announcement into context. The series of events that we've seen leading up to the announcement, we cannot trivialize. We have to remember first that the first presidential debate, I don't know if that still counts as the first presidential debate, but that was on June 27th. I think that was a cringe-worthy debate. I have talked about that in a previous uh, Q&A like this, and I will encourage people to go back to it. Since June the 27th, the first presidential debate, there has been no shortage of drama since that time. June 27th debate was a dismal performance by Joe Biden. Everybody talked about that, including some key Democrats. The, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more border patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. The people who were texting with me were um, very concerned um, about uh, President Biden seeming extremely feeble. Um, he didn't do well at all. Uh, he, he did not do well at all. And just as Twitter and the media began focusing on Biden's cognitive health decline, then you have the issue where some crazy guy planned an attack that uh, Trump narrowly escaped. And you think for it. And then you have key endorsement for Donald Trump since that time, including key people like Elon Musk. And following after was the RNC convention where Trump chose his vice presidential candidate. And now we're dealing with the Secret Service directors testifying before Congress about the attempted assassination on Trump. Since that time, since the debate, we found donors have actually pulled back from the Democratic candidates, which is Joe Biden. And then you found Democrats actually pushed Joe Biden off the cliff. Now, Biden steps down in the recent announcement and nominates Kamala Harris. And in fact, the way the announcement was carried out, we have to remember that as well. There is... The tweet he had first of all put up, which it was so questionable, in which people questioned even the digital signature that was on the announcement on Twitter, but I wouldn't dwell on that. Now, do I think the concerns about his mental decline is the reason he stepped down? I think Biden has a personal ambition for power. And he made that clear, you know, in, in the announcement that he gave just uh, two days ago. And I don't blame him. Many of us, you know, most of us have personal ambitions, but he has personal ambition for power. And in fact, there is an anger about his stepping down. So deep down within him, he wouldn't step down if donors didn't pull back and if key Democrats didn't abandon him. So the other thing is, did he step down to unite the party like he claims? I really doubt that. And I'll tell you why. I think key Democrats had actually abandoned him. Key Democrats like um, Hakim Jeffries, like Jerry Nandler, like Adam Smith, like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. And I think 
over 30 key Democrats that actually abandoned him, as well as donors that abandoned him. Now, several outlets reporting that a number of senior Democrats on the call called for the president to stand aside. Uh, those members being uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler, Congressman Adam Smith, Congressman Mark Tucano, and Congressman Joe Morales of New York. Uh, the significance of it being those four is that they are all the senior Democrats on House committees. When I think about it, I think this is one of my frustration about political opinions and, ad uh, and idolizing political issues. There's no shortage of opinions out there. In fact, there's an abundance of conversations and opinions out there right now to a point of contempt on social media, on podcasts, and everywhere. Opinions, you know, by nature sometimes could be contemptuous, especially when you have so many of them. They hardly mean much. They come to a point that they don't mean as much as you at least want them to. And what you find in this case is... Biden stepping down is whether we like it or not. It frustrates me that, you know, the nation after a democratic election process is often stuck with a four-year term of a president until you have the opportunity to re-elect another candidate. Now, political opinions hardly count until it gets to the point of a civil disobedience. People will say, or I would say, a civil disobedience is the is the action from the unheard. It is what the unheard people do. But until it gets to that point, political opinions about Biden's mental decline does not really count. He stepped down, in my opinion, because donors abandoned him and key Democrats abandoned him. And, you know, we can say many things with respect to, you know, the weakness in democratic systems, but I think it was... Um, um, Churchill that said that you will be frustrated about democracy until you consider the alternatives to democracy and then you realize that there's some good in democracy. But that's what I think immediately right after I saw Biden's announcement from Twitter and from two days ago from the Oval Office. I think the issue with appraising Biden's mental health decline must also be, be seen in context. You know, about three weeks ago, the media told all of us that Biden was as sharp as a tech. That was a line from the entire liberal media. And four days ago, you know, the guy was forced to resign as a Democratic nominee. I don't even think his staff were informed about that decision. Now they tell us that Kamala Harris is the best thing that ever happened since sliced bread to the nation. Now, processing that, it sounds to me like a third world classic. And I'll tell you why. Because I think people hardly know the meaning when you say, oh, it's a third world classic. I think in minds of people, when you say third world, they're imagining... Uh, people living on trees and living in the forest. I don't think that is so, but let me let me draw some parallels here. I'll give you the example of Paul Bia from Cameroon, the president uh, um, since 1982, I believe, in Cameroon. His deteriorating health has gotten worse to the point that he, he is not even aware of where he is most times. Now, just the other day, you, you saw that guy sat down and he farted at a U.S.-Africa leader summit. And then you have another example like Robert Mugabe from Zimbabwe. The guy spent 30 years in power until he was forced to resign in 2017. He also had a decline in health to the point that he couldn't walk. And then you have others like... Uh, the president of South Sudan since 2011, that's Kir Mayardit. And the guy peed himself up in, up in public during a public occasion. And you have, even in a place like Nigeria, the most populous black nation, the most populous African nation, the giant of Africa, you will say, Bola Tinubu there, who was been in power at different levels from the Senate to governorship and to presidency, 
since the 90s or maybe even the late 80s, you saw the dude fell off the stage the other day at a national event. And there are others across Africa like that. You have Museveni from Uganda, who has been the president since 1986. And then you have in Burkina Faso, you have Kampore. Uh, who has been the president from 1987 until 2014. He spent almost 30 years in office. All of these people that I referred to, they had decline in health issues during their administration. And what you find common to them is the fact that their close associates, their family members, and media sometimes covers up those facts. And that's why I call what we've seen about Biden's health decline, a third world classic. Now, let me give you the example for Biden, which may, many people know this already. We saw the other, other day, right? Obama had to pull him off the stage. He calls Zelensky Putin. He's wandering around a stage as if he's never seen one before. He constantly forgets his train of thought. We saw that at the debate. He mumbles his words, he mumbles and fumbles. He falls off the steps onto, onto Air Force One. He wanders around the stage, you know, like, you know, I saw Trump mocking him about that, almost like he's never seen a stage before. And then you have Jill Biden, who helps him down the stairs right after the debate. Now, the, the hypocrisy is what baffles me the most, you know, especially when it's coming from the pristine you know, this angelic, first world, democratic country. It's the same way you find the close aides to this third world country leaders hide in broad daylight that you find the close aide to Biden lying to the nation. And I get it. I get it. On one hand, power is sweet. Power is intoxicating. Power is corrupting. In fact, it's often said, right, that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when you think about the first lady, Jill Biden, I get why she's doing what, what she's doing. I, I needed to spend time to even try to wrap my head around the thought going through her mind. But I get it. I get the fact that she goes into oblivion once her husband leaves office. I will compare this, for instance, with the wife to Musa Yaradua, Tara Yaradua in Nigeria, that was in 2008, I believe. She also covered up the declining health of her husband until the guy died in office. I get it that someone like Jill Biden, there is no more Air Force One. There is no more glamorous lifestyle. There is no more White House dinners with dignitaries. There is no more being treated like royalty while traveling the world. I think my fear is that actually that she values these things over the husband's health decline. And I think, you know, most wives, actually, most reasonable wives, and, and permit me to say that, most wives would complain when their husbands are working full throttle. I, I can talk for myself. My wife will complain when I work full throttle for many days because she knows how detrimental that could be to my health. Now, these are not different from what we've seen from African first ladies as well that I've mentioned above. They do the same to their husbands because, goodness, power is sweet. And you look at it also, you know, stress will aggravate this guy's neurological deterioration. Instead, you find, you know, he's being pulled up the stage like an infant and the wife speaking for him where he can't. Maybe he's taking a nap or something. Who knows? But I think... The stress of presidency would actually aggravate his medical situation. I think actually, you know, appraising Biden's mental decline, in my opinion, I think Biden's last real decision will probably be about six months ago. And I have reasons why I say that, which I don't have to get into right now, but I think we can talk about that some other day. Just before we get back into the conversation, can I plead with you again to support the efforts that I put into this channel? My goal is to get the channel to a thousand subscribers through this video you're watching right now. But I can't achieve that without you. So please, click on the subscribe button and also like the video so that more people can watch it. And let's get back into the conversation. I think the choice for Kamala Harris has unfortunately become 
a polarizing choice. I think not on the camp of the Democrats, but in the nation generally, especially between Republicans and Democrats and even the independents. Once upon a time, Kamala Harris was called the most liberal presidential candidate that was in 2020, and she's now crowned the queen and champion of democracy. I, I actually, I struggle to recount any strong value systems, or let me even say policies that Kamala represents, even if I come from all the way 2020 during her, her the presidential primaries, the only set of things I remember, sadly, or maybe I'm just being negative in my mind, or I just remember the negative things only. The only things I remember is the Green New Deal. Her support for Black Lives Matters, rioting and looting. I remember the open borders. I remember wanting to legalize drugs without any restraint. I remember unhinged abortion rights. I remember all of these. And in fact, if it sounds like I'm crazy, I saw an interview on CNN with Elizabeth Warren just about two days ago where Elizabeth Warren actually captures this fact in that CNN interview in that the key reason why she believes and why other key Democrats believe that Kamala Harris is the best choice for the nation right now or even for the world is because of her fight for women. And when they're talking about the fight for women, they're actually referring, and I quote here, um, Elizabeth Warren, the fight here is actually the fight for abortion rights. I don't think the fight for abortion rights is the only right that concerns even the women, American women, or globally women, or even North American women. I think there are several other important issues in the minds of people apart from abortion rights, or maybe alongside abortion rights. And I even remember someone like Kamala had a very dismal campaign in 2020. The other thing I will mention here is about DEI. And I know this is a very treacherous ground to, to walk these days because of how, how polarizing uh, DEI topics are. But I think this is one time when many people have actually referred to the choice for Kamala as a DEI choice. And you see Democrats go crazy about it because I think the liberals now get it that a DEI hire is actually a sign of organizational weakness most times, especially when your DEI is only founded in the color of the skin or in gender. I think there are other, other factors that go into DEI if you really want to be a proponent of DEI. There are, you know, diversity of thoughts. But often when we talk about DEI, that's not what we're referring to. But the, the liberals go crazy now because now they see that indeed when you do a DEI hire that the Republicans and moderates are pointing out, it's actually a sign of organizational weakness. And now they are attacking that. My wish is this, that, you know, I wish more, more respectable, more dignified and true champions of Women are fielded for power positions and political office, political appointments like this. But many times, uh, the, the choice of the women that are fielded for this kind of positions are the people who can't even define what womanhood is. And you're wondering what do you represent when you say you are the first black woman to occupy this position. Yet you can't even put into context what you mean by a woman. I wish it's the people that exalt the true worth of womanhood beyond the skirts. I, I wish, you know, you exalt the womanhood as the source of, of nurture, of training, of love. I wish you exalt the place of womanhood in, in home making, home building, out of which many times also you find visionary leaders and women and some very high performing women also holding power positions just like their male counterparts. I wish that's what we exalt. I wish we're not exalting women who denigrate womanhood into vagina owners or persons with vulvas. I wish you know, we're exalting the sacredness in the beauty, in the worth, in the value, in the excellence that a woman puts into, you know, as, 
as nitty gritty as building a home to the larger society where many women are also holding, you know, power positions, leadership, effectively, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder, head to head with their male counterparts. I wish that's the case. It, it really pains my heart, actually, for women even beyond the, the, the sociological problems that this creates. But I think it actually robs the woman of their, the woman of their identity most times when we feel the women like this. I wish strong women are fielded whose values transcend abortion rights, who really fight for the true essence of women, not fighting to distort the true identity of a woman. I wish values that are well established in you know, the positions of pride for women from homes to sports to all the different professions, including the leadership roles in the society, is actually, is actually highlighted and dignified when we make those kind of choices. But sadly, I don't find that in Kamala Harris. I've said it before that America got lucky that Trump didn't die in that assassination attempt on his life. I think some people have actually said that the attempt had the potential, if it was successful, to have led the nation into a civil war. I think if not civil war, at least some level of tensions would have been heightened from that if it was successful. I think the issue must be seen in context. The the attack, to a great extent as much as I've noticed, has actually energized Trump and the Republican camp. There are other things I can say about the attack, but I don't want to go back to it because I've actually talked about that in the previous Q&A like this. But I think since 2020, I will sound some note of caution here and maybe criticizes some things also in the Republican camps that I have actually seen of late. Since 2020, what I noticed is that Republicans stand the risk of idolizing Trump. And I say that because they often forget that great as Trump's policies are or could be, he still needs voices of correction around him. And I think many times Republicans have actually failed with respect to that and relating with Trump. The same thing goes for the evangelical support that Trump gets. He gets a lot of evangelicals on his side. I think the evangelical support needs to also come with a sense of objectivity. And by objectivity, I think, you know, as great as you can talk about the COVID response in Trump's administration in 2020 or in 2019, one of the things that Trump lacked is words that come from empathy. He lacked empathy. He didn't show that much to the nation. Let's call it for what it is. His policies were great. Biden, on the other hand, actually did that right. The only thing was that, you know, data shows that more people died under Biden's administration of COVID vaccines than they did under Trump while even trying to develop COVID, the COVID vaccine. But I think it's because the voices around Trump are actually not sufficiently voices of correction. And, you know, leadership has... You stand the risk of, you know, running afoul of errors... You can actually commit blunders in leadership when you don't surround yourself with voices of correction. And I think Trump will really need to do that going forward. I think also, you know, the, the relationship that Trump has with Africa, it needs to be modified. That could be better. I wouldn't go into details, you know, some reckless statements that I think he uttered in the past. I think some of those need to change going forward. He needs to be a, a little more level-headed guy. And, you know, I, I tweeted about that recently, you know, when I saw the, the speech he gave at the RNC convention. You know, I think to some extent, tragedy has a way of taming each one of us. I guess to some extent, the tragedy, the attempted assassination on his life is kind of taming him, but we'll see how that goes. I think Trump and the Republican Party will also need some serious strategy to to win Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris just raised over $80 million donation just in, in 24 hours. I don't even know how that happened. 
but they need some serious strategy strategy and i think the fear here also is that the young democrats are actually going to vote for kamala the the young democratic women especially i don't know if the middle-aged women who didn't vote for hillary in 2016 will vote for her i doubt that and i think the older women may not vote for her but all the college you know young ladies that we've been seeing doing all this protest of late i believe they will vote for kamala and Trump and his team will have to strategize if they want to win that election. And I think the, the other thing that was sound here is that, you know, the, the Christian community, you know, especially among the Republicans who've been talking about, you know, God saved Trump from death. And, you know, there are prophecies that have been given about this. And being saved from death may equal that he is going to win the next elections. I, I think that is at best nonsensical. And this is where I will sound the caution that even when it comes to the sovereignty of God, a lot of times the sovereignty of God is actually tied to the, to the will of men. The will of men is what you're going to find on ballots. And if that's the case, I think Trump's team would need to do a, a heck of a good job to convince the people in their will to actually check the box for him. So, on the other hand, too, I think Republicans also have their own extreme value systems. They connect with many people, you know, on the, on the grounds of individual prosperity and corporate enterprise, I believe, for the most part, versus the, the Marxist approach that you have on the Democratic side to running a society. And I think I should sound a note of warning here, even both to, to Democrats and Republicans, that countries can be lost. Countries can go to ruins until visionary leadership who can actually see beyond their time can put resources together and marshal people in the nation and drive for a positive change. And, you know, the note of warning here is actually this. To a great extent, and I know people may disagree with me for saying this, to a great extent, Democrats are actually seeing a future that they've carved out in their minds and in their imagination, which is great. And I think even at individual level, we all should do that, where we carve out a future in our minds. But I think the Republicans also need to carve out a true, well-defined future that they capture and to some extent can articulate. You know, the way the Democratic side articulates the Green New Deal, the way they articulate their abortion right, the way they articulate, you know, the climate emergency and the looming catastrophe that they, they tell us every time. The Republicans, you know, beyond being stuck in the language of the past about moral values and the like, I think the Republicans also need to see beyond the time capture thought and present it to the nation. And I think that is really lacking from what I've been seeing on the Republican side of, of late. But I think I'll stop it there. The whole world should actually care about the selections beyond Americans. And I hope, you know, people are paying attention to this. You know, I saw the tweet from Biden the other day that Biden and Trump actually agree on one thing. They agree on the fact that this is probably the most important election in our lifetime. And I've said this before in a previous Q&A like this, but I will rehash some things here. Many things hang in the balance in this election. What hangs in the balance is, you know, between the Democrat and Republicans is the creation of a new world order through socialism, through globalization, territorial identities that can be lost, through globalization, through socialism, a national interest that can go into oblivion forever, those things are hanging in the balance right now. And, you know, when you talk about some of these things, people wonder, like, why, why the heck do you care? Like, why do you care? You're not being American. You're not even going to vote. And, you know, sometimes I say people in the ends of the earth, even as far as Africa should care about this. Why? Because the fact is actually that third world nations will suffer the most. If territorial identities are lost, your profitable enterprise is gone forever. If national interest is gone, the tendency to build your nation is gone forever. And I've said it before, 
policies, especially social policies, do not become global policies until they are enacted in the United States. And pay attention to that. Let me state also that the alternative to world powers are cruel. China, Russia, these countries will split the global resources. And when they split global resources, it's, it's almost going to look like another slave trade because the poor nations will suffer the most. And of course, you know, when, when, when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. You know, think about the consequences also in the sense of an imminent world war. We have two major wars going on globally right now. Think through the details of life. And I think this is where I will admonish our American friends who are going to be the ones voting in the elections that think through the details of life. The stakes are higher than your political preferences. And the way I think about the stakes is that it's almost the way I think about the stakes in my life from every major decision that I have to make. You know, I think about it like this. What do I want the world to look like 10 years from now? After I die, what would the world look like? Will the world be a poverty-stricken world? Will it be a wasted human resources and natural resources? Will, will it be a, wo a world full of wars and terrors? You know, think about it. The other way I like to think about it is this. I believe in afterlife. If when I die, if it's possible to look down from the sky what do you want to see on the earth if it's possible to roll in your grave and take a peep from the soil what do you want to see on the earth and i think those kind of conversations is what you find hanging in the ballot right now i think it's beyond all oh, people saying it's either vote for trump or vote for biden or vote for the couch i think those are those don't really capture the essence of what is going on why do you really hold true to the political stains that you have right now? How do you appraise the issue? And I think this is where real decisions need to be made going forward. Can I plead with you again to support the efforts that I put into this channel? I am just a regular guy with a background in scientific research. I currently do R&D engineering. And I'm genuinely concerned about the trajectory of modern society and our nation as well. I feel the urgency and need for balanced perspectives and insights that can genuinely help you, you watching this right now and every other viewer out there to be able to navigate the complexities of life. That's why I put so much effort into doing the research, attending to the technical details involved with producing these videos you're watching. I currently do all of these on top of my job. So let me plead with you and ask you to help support this channel. My goal is to get the channel to a thousand subscribers through this video you're watching right now. But I can't achieve that without you. So please click on the subscribe button and also like the video so that more people can watch it and they can also make informed decisions as well about the issues we talk about on this channel. Now, I hope you will do that. Click on the subscribe button and like the video.